Praise God. It's good to be in God's house. Amen. I hope you're excited. We're so thankful that you're here. We're so thankful to be here. Um, His presence is always with us. Amen. And aren't you thankful that he allows us to come into his presence so that uh, we can experience him? He's a good God. Amen. Um, We're so thankful, as I said, that you're here. If you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1. Um, we're going to be dealing with um, value today and, and our value. Many times we don't realize the value that has been placed upon us by God. But I pray that by His Holy Spirit and through His Word, He'll, He will give us some insight into um, what He has done for us and the value He places upon us as believers. You are not an accident today. You are here on purpose. God has created you uh, for a reason and a purpose. And uh, I think one of the things that many Christians uh, struggle with is understanding the value that Christ places upon you as a believer. And, uh, and so we just pray that God, again, by His Holy Spirit, would reveal this to us. If you have your Bibles, or uh, would you stand with us? And even if you don't, please uh, stand with us this morning for the reading of God's Word. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. We're going to begin in in verse 5. He says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. Father, we're so thankful today, God. That you have given us your word. That, Father, that we can understand, God, and know um, your purpose and your plans for our lives, God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that we would uh, see through your word, God, um, what you have done on behalf of your people, God. How that, Lord, that you have uh, given all things to us, Father, for, um, for our good. And that, Lord, that we would, we would not just sit idly by and be hearers of the word, but, God, that we would truly be transformed and become doers of your word. That we would put into action, Father, the things that we hear and learn, Father, from your word. And, Holy Spirit, that you would give us the desire and the strength to perform it. We thank you for all that you do in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And amen. Before you're seated, let somebody know uh, it was so good to worship with you this morning. Praise God. Amen. And you may be seated. Now, we may not be prophets, but God has a purpose and a plan for you and for me. The first part of this verse applies to all of us. He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And then he goes on to say, before you were born, I sanctified you. That means that he set you <clears throat> apart. He made you special all on, all on your own. And you are not an accident. <clears throat> he has a purpose for you. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing when we begin to understand the heart and the mind of God towards us as his people. So the voice of God comes and he, 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 speaking to Jeremiah, he announces some extraordinary things. And, and the worth that he places instantly upon Jeremiah and every human being is immeasurable. You and I couldn't even put a price tag on the value that Christ puts upon us. So our worth to God, it started before you were born. That's what he says. Before you were born, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. See, even before you were, you were in your mother's womb, you were valuable to God. Before God, uh, be- before anything ever happened, before the worlds were begun, um, You were valuable because you were already born in the heart of God. You you have to understand, when God purposes a thing, it's not like human beings. When we say, well, I really love or I really want to, that doesn't mean that it's going to get done. But when God purposes something in His heart, it's as good as done. 
And so before the worlds were created, before you were born, and before anything was, was created, you were already on the heart and the mind of God. And so this fact, it can't be changed. It cannot be taken away. No one can remove this from you. This is something that you can never lose because God had purposed something for you. Look at what David wrote in Psalm 139. He says, I will praise you, excuse me, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. 139, 14. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made because God created me with a purpose. He already had a plan for me. All of my days, the Bible said, were written in a book before one of them came to pass. So I believe that when we stand before Jesus and the Bible says in the books were opened, guess what? Your book will be opened too. And so he has a plan and a purpose for you. And so we're fearfully and wonderfully made with this thought and intention in mind. You were given the free will to choose. So God has a plan and a purpose for you, but I can tell you this, Satan has a plan and a purpose for you also. So God says to you and me, I, I set before you life and death, choose life, even gives us the answer. But too often, what, what, what we do is, is um, well, I get to choose, uh, I'll choose B, death. And this is a hard thing for us, but this is the reason why we're fearfully and wonderfully made, because we get to choose. We don't walk around like robots. We don't, we don't, we don't walk around, and we are not like everybody else. God deliberately chose, and, and here it goes, um, even though sometimes we see that, that, that this is used for political reasons, and, and we don't want to, we're, we're not even going to entertain it, but here's the thing, God chose your race, your gender, your color, your hair, the, the color of your eyes, the color of your skin, all of it, He chose it all and said, perfect, well done. Think about that. God was the one that chose you. He even chose your parents and where you would be born. He looked at all of time and he, and he chose the very date that you would be born in time throughout all of, the, the, all of time that we as humans would know. And he knew right where to put you and he had a plan and a purpose for you. The Bible says that God's thoughts towards us are as, are as, as many as the sand of the seashore. Now, you and I couldn't even think that God has all of these thoughts towards us. Before we were ever born, He already had our lives planned out for us. But we get to choose. Hmm. I don't want to go there, but sometimes uh, we choose our way rather than God's. And we'll get there just a little bit as we go along. But He's done the same for you. He's done the same for me. And he's done the same for every single human being. There is not one of us alike. Jeremiah is standing there. He gets this, he has this understanding as God is speaking to him. And, and all of a sudden, I, I wonder what he must have felt when he heard the voice of God speaking to him saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Jeremiah's obviously understanding that here's God who he, he's, he's hearing the voice of God. He's the creator of the universe. He's the one that's put all the stars in place. He's the one that's formed the worlds and everything in them. He's the one that, that, is, that is thought of every single detail that even scientists with their microscopes get down and they are still discovering even the very minute details of the things that God has put together all in time. And Jeremiah's thinking, who am I? And he realizes God has placed value upon me. How would we feel? I think we would probably, with, with the psalmist in Psalm chapter 8, like David said in verse 4, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you would visit him? David stands up on the palace where God has placed him one day, looks up into the heavens, sees the stars and sees everything in it and sees the grandeur of God. And all of a sudden the thought comes to him, who is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you would even pay him a visit? 
Do you understand? We, we, the, the, the reason we don't place value upon many times upon ourselves is because we don't place value upon God. We don't realize who God is. Sometimes, and I, and I will say this, sometimes we think more about ourselves than we do about God. We think somehow we're greater than God is. And therefore, we devalue ourselves by focusing on ourselves. But when we see God for who He truly is, and I can just imagine as David that night is standing, and it doesn't have the, 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 the light pollution that we have in our day and time because there's not city street lights on every corner. He's standing there looking at the dark skies and sees every star and they're, they're, they're multi, can't even count them and thinks, God, with all of this, who is man that you are mindful of? Him? The son of man that you would even think of paying him a visit. How important are we that God should even pay attention to us? And David understands and realizes something in that moment, and it's a humbling thought that God has placed value upon me. This theme of value follows us throughout the Word of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul's writing to the church of Ephesus. In chapter 2 and verse 10, and he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So what this verse says to us as believers is we are God's workmanship. God has worked and He has developed us. And guess what? We are still being developed. He is still working on us. Like the, like the old nursery song we used to sing in, 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 in children's church. He's still working. It took Him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. But He's still working on me. And see, we are, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of performing good works. And this is, where, this is where a lot of people get stuck. Well, I'm not saved. You're not saved by your works. But you sure are saved for some good works. And so, so not only has God placed value upon you because he has noticed you. But he has also placed value upon you because he has given you and I a purpose. Something to do, something to fulfill, something to fulfill, which God has prepared, the Bible teaches us, from before the foundations of the world, all of our days were written in a book before one of them came to pass, and so each one of us is unique, and there is something that God has given each one of us to do that nobody else can do. That's powerful. See, when we think about the thoughts that God thinks towards us, and that they're so, so numerous then we can't understand, we can't even begin to understand all the details of our lives that God went into just to create us, to, to cause us to come into being, and then to, to live our lives out. All of those things God thought of, every one of them, before He even began. This is the God that we serve. Every person wants their life to count. Every person wants to make a difference. So we ask ourselves the question, why am I here? So why am I here? And I believe that we've already begun to answer this. But you're here to make a difference. You're here to make a difference in this world. Let me go a little bit further and challenge the mind on this one. Hmm. God has placed you here. To change the world. See, he's placed you here to change your, your environment. To be a change, a, a, a positive change in, in the, the area or the realm of your influence. God has, God has given you a purpose. And what God has called you to do, nobody else can do. I'm reminded of the, 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 the movie Incredibles. I'm sure that most of you have seen it. And there's a scene in there where the dad is, he's frustrated because he's no longer allowed to be a superhero. And so he's 
going to his nine to five. He's wanting to make a difference and, and he sees things that are happening. He just wants something. He just wants to do something. He gets out of his car and in frustration, he shuts the door and, and then he gets ready to pick the car up and, and just completely crush it. And he looks over and there's this little kid on a tricycle, right? And he looks over at him and the kid's just there and he won't move and he says, um, what are you waiting for? And he says, something amazing. <laughs> you see, here's the thing. God has created us for amazing things. See, we, the reason we don't realize that they're amazing is because um, maybe, maybe we don't understand fully the value or the worth God has placed upon our lives. You see, Christ gives us everything that the world is after. The thing is, is it's just in a different package and they don't, and they don't recognize it. What are people after? People are after power. They're after position. They're after all of these things. Well, the Bible says that all power is given unto us that believe in heaven and in earth. Position, you want position? Christ says, that the Bible says that I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. People don't realize what Christians have. Not even Christians understand fully their value. God has given us all things. You talk about wealth. We have wealth in us un, untold. And yet people look in there. They, they kill for wealth and all of these things. You say, well, well, pastor, if you had so much wealth. then The Bible says um, having nothing yet possessing all things. You see, the thing is, is why? Because there's a reason for my value. I'm not an accident. And what you need to understand is you have infinite value because of who you are in Christ. Jesus taught on our value. And he spoke in, in Luke chapter, thir- uh, chapter 15. And he spoke three parables. And I'm not going to read them all, and I'm not going to read most of it, but in Luke chapter 15, starting with verse 4, he says, suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and lost one. Wouldn't you leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the lost until you found it? And when you find it, you can be sure that you would put it across your shoulders rejoicing. And when you got home and called your friends, you'd call your friends and neighbors, celebrate with me for I've found my lost sheep. Count on it. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner's life than 99 good people. Here's here's the thing. Christ puts the value on you and he says, here's the shepherd has 99 sheep, leaves them all together because they're okay. He leaves them behind with, I'm sure, someone. And he says, I will not return until I find the one that has been lost. Willing to put his own life on the line. And he says, and when he gets back, don't you think for a moment, don't you think that he's going to call everybody else and say and celebrate because the one that was lost has come home, was found. He's going to celebrate. And I can tell you this, he's going to celebrate in the fact that he's going to tell of, of this great mystery, this great adventure that he had to go through to find that one lost. The value he places on the one. He goes on to say and speak of a lost coin that a, that a woman had and she had a lost coin and so she loses it in her house and so she turns over every piece of furniture. She moves every, every, every rug, shakes it, sweeps every corner of the floor because this one coin is valuable to her. It, it, it describes her livelihood. It's everything to her. Without it, she's going, to, she's going to be without. She might lose her home. She might lose everything. And so the Bible says that when she finds this coin, she celebrates, calls all of those around her. She throws a party because this one thing that was lost has now been found. Think about that. The value that she places upon this. And finally, we see the story of the prodigal son. 
And in this story, the prodigal son asks for his inheritance. He goes out and he uses it, wastes it on riotous living, the Bible says. In other words, he hits every bar, strip club, and everything on the way out. And he does everything and he just wastes everything because he didn't understand the value that he had already had in his father's house. Well, he has an older brother also that's in the house. And the older brother is watching this. The older brother can only see from the outside because he doesn't even understand his value and he lives in the house. And so the younger brother finally comes to the place where he's wrestling a hog over a husk and he realizes, what am I doing? In my father's house, his servants have more than enough to eat. And here I am wrestling with a pig over a piece of... A piece of leftover scraps. And then he begins to understand the value that he had in his father's house. So the Bible says when he comes home, the father meets him. He sees him from afar off coming down the road. And the father doesn't even wait. Throws open the doors. Because he knows that for his son to be walking down that road, he has come to his senses. He he has come to understand his value. When he comes in, he looks at the father and the father, he tries to tell the father all the things that he rehearsed. I don't deserve this. I'm I'm not privy to this. And the father says, put a robe on him. Put some shoes on him. Give me a ring and put it on his hand because my son that was lost has come home. The father places value on the son. But the older son sits there, arms crossed, just like he ate a lemon. Father throws the party, invites everybody over. My son that was lost has come home. The older son's sitting out there in the field doing whatever work because he doesn't want to be a part of it. And the father comes in and says... Why don't you come and rejoice with us because your brother who was lost has now come home. And see, and here's the son that's been there. He doesn't understand his value because because he's been living in the house. And I would dare say that there are some Christians that have been coming to church that, 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 that know God and know about God. And yet they don't realize their value. And he says, don't you realize that your brother has come home. He was lost and now he's found. The oldest son says, well, you cut, you killed the fatted calf. You did all of these things. You've never done that for me. And that's because my brother went out and he wasted all of it in riotous living. And he says, but here's here's the thing, son. He says, you've been in my house. And everything that I have was always yours. At any time you wanted, you could have taken that heifer. You could have slaughtered, you could have thrown a party. Because everything I have is yours. See, because he didn't realize His value. And he was in the house. What we learn from this is. Relationship. Is most important. Relationship with Christ is most important. In America we we, we place great value on youth. On beauty, on athletic ability, intelligence, education, wealth, fame, and all of these things. But if you've ever noticed, there's not as much value placed upon relationships. Because it's all about you. The Bible puts more value on relationships than anything else. See, the shepherd lost his sheep. The woman had lost her coin. The father had lost his son. The loss was so great because of the relationship that existed. That's mine. That's my sheep. That's my coin. That's my son. And there was value there because God says to us, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And so God places value upon us. How? God knows me. And therefore, I have great value. And no matter what the enemy tells you or the devil or anybody else, you are not an accident. God has placed value upon you. God has set you apart. God has brought you here. 
God's placed great value upon your life. The problem is, is that you've taken it for granted. Or you've underestimated his appraisal of your life as the older son. He underestimated that he was in the house. He underestimated his relationship with the Father. And so many Christians underestimate their relationship with God. You ask, well, what value? Well, well John 3.16 tells us that God gave his one and only Son for you. And if you thought that wasn't enough... As a result, we've been given an all-access pass to everything that belongs to Christ because of our relationship with Him. If you think relationship isn't enough, you better think again. Look in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 26 The Bible says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us. Relationship. You may not know how to pray, but all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes and intercedes on your behalf. The Bible says, with groanings too deep for words. This is relationship. So the Spirit now intercedes for me. And he who searches the hearts knows what's in the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints' relationship. See, he intercedes for the saints. Why is he interceding for you? Because of your relationship to him. Draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. He says, according to the will of God. Remember the story that God has written of over your life, the books that have been laid out. This is, the, this is what the Spirit of God is interceding for you according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, relationship. You see it? To those who are called according to His purpose, relationships. See, God, He's called you. He, you because you have responded to His love and now you're called according to His purpose. He's given you a purpose, value. He says, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. This is relationship. So that He would be the firstborn among many brethren, And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. This is all due to relationship. The Amplified explains this: the glorification in this way. Raising them to a heavenly dignity and and condition or state of being. In other words, he has placed you, seated you at the right hand of the Father in Christ Jesus. He's raised you and I up. He's given us position of power. Isn't that what the world fights over? And all of these things that the world is greedy for and fighting over, God comes and gives to us because of our relationship with Him. He says, what shall, the, the, what shall we say then to these things? And we, and we know these verses. We quote them often. If God is for us, relationship Are you with me? If God is for us, in other words, if I'm in relationship with God, then who could be against me? It's not that I'm not going to have enemies, but who could be against me and prevail? None could. Why? Because God is for me. And then hear this. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Relationship. In other words, if God didn't spare his son, his one and only son, what is he going to hold back from you and me? Everything that, is, that, that, that he has, everything that, that's his, the Bible declares that that's ours. Everything. 
I know that we like to minimize God and we don't think that he's as great as we sing of that he is. How great is our God, but we don't really think you're that great. But he's great. Greater than we could think or imagine. Who will bring charge against God's elect relationship? God is the one who justifies. And who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who dies. Yes, rather that, yea, rather that lives and who is raised. Who is at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us? So I have the Holy Spirit interceding for me. And Christ is at the right hand of the Father interceding for me. And they're both on the same page. This is deep calling out to deep. This is the Spirit of God in me calling out to Jesus Christ and God the Father praying that the will of God would be done in my life. This is all due to relationship and the value that God places upon us. You say, well, Pastor, well, what about those who are developmentally challenged? Maybe even mentally challenged. Those who, for the most part, are not able to care for themselves many of whom will never contribute anything to society. And I'm not, we're not being in any way uh, belittling. They're totally, de totally dependent on others to take care of them. Many of them, they can't speak. They're not physically attractive. They'll never have a relationship outside of their parents and those of their caretakers. They may never earn an income. Some of them can't even control their bodily functions. What value do they have? Well, according to the scriptures, they're of immense value. Look what he says in Ezekiel chapter 18. In Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 4, he says, For every living soul belongs to me. Think about that. The Father as well as the Son both alike belong to me for every living soul belongs to me God is jealous for your soul he's jealous for the spirit the Bible says that is within you to be obedient to him and here's the part where we're fearfully and, and, and wonderfully made because he says every living soul belongs to me the father as well as the son both alike belong to me and the soul who sins is the one who will die and so what that means is when the relationship is broken, that soul begins to die. It loses its value because it's no longer connected to the creator, the one who created it, the very source of life. Because if you remember, in him is life. And in no other is life but Jesus Christ. And anything that is connected to Christ has life. He teaches this even in the vine. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. As long as you stay connected to me, you will produce fruit. And any branch that doesn't will be cut off. Why? Because that's death. And sin is the thing that separates us. Now, because God places great value upon these, even these that, that, that the world would reject, we should recognize their value by our actions not merely by the things that we say, but by how we behave, how we live our lives. Many times, many people have found their profession or their calling because of others that have needed their help that cannot do for themselves. And because of that person, you have, you have been given value and purpose. Isn't it amazing? And then to do for somebody something that they cannot do for you in return. What a humbling thought. It's an amazing thing. So you say, well, how do we do this? By understanding that we're all connected. By our Creator. And it brings us back to relationship. There's so much a part of this, this creation. There's so much a part of what God is doing. There's just as important as any, anybody else out there. Teachers and doctors and nurses. And all of those that take care of them. God has placed value upon them. Maybe God through them is teaching us what true value is. 
Because you have those who, who say they care and, and you have those who, who in false humility, and this is not that false humility that says, that says, oh God, I'm nothing. Many times that person is so proud, but they just want, they have this false sense of humility. And it's, and it's not this other that you beat yourself up that, that I'm so terrible, I'll never be amount to, no, that's what Satan would like to tell you. But God is the one that places value upon you. Remember we read out of Psalm chapter 8. The way that we, the, the way that we help them. The way that we use is we use our gifts, our talents, our callings for others. To help others and to bring glory to God. Because again you were created for good works but in psalm chapter 8 and verse 4 remember what the psalmist was saying what is man that you are mindful of him the son of man the earthborn man that you even care for him and i'm reading out of the amplified he says yet you have made him a little lower than and and i know that this may this may stump some people but it's the same word elohim it's the same word for angelic beings angels you have made him a little lower than God or heavenly beings. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Do you remember I'm, a, I'm an heir and a, a joint heir with Jesus Christ? God has created us, made us a little lower than, than the angels, than the Elohim. And then he has put us in creation and we are to be in charge of stewards of all of his creation. We are to have dominion. We are to have authority. We are to have power. But the reason too often Christians don't is because they don't know their value. And they don't realize the value that God has placed upon us. We are the ones that God has called so that we could, we could change the places, the, 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 the environment around us. We are the ones that God injects into culture to make an impact and change the world around us. And too often we are allowing the world to change us. But again, we are joint heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And the Bible says this in Genesis 1 and 27. God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You are created in the image of God. You are created as a replica to some degree of God in order to, to, to take authority, to have dominion, to be able to, to have that same kind of power. The Bible says, these signs shall follow them that believe. And yet we, we wonder and we have people that don't believe in laying hands. We have people that don't believe in the power of God. We have people, well the Bible teaches us that I, you are created in the image of God. And he has seated us in heavenly places. And he's given us power over all the power of the devil. Will we believe it? God goes on to tell Jeremiah... I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans of welfare, not for evil. To give you a future and give you a hope. Can I tell you this? Maybe, maybe you're here in this place today and you don't realize that God has great plans for you. God has plans to give you a future and plans to give you a hope. An expected end, other translations say. In other words, God has placed great, so, much, so, great, so great a value upon you that He's already prepared things ahead of time for you. And the reason that, that you've allowed the enemy to lie to you, the reason that, and this is one of the, the, the great tactics of the enemy, he's going to lie to you so that you do not realize the value that God has placed on you. So much so that God gave His one and only 
son. Too many times and too often people beat themselves up because of things they cannot control. I'm not pretty enough. You know, as I said, God chose you. He made you who you are, the color of your skin, the color of your hair, even the height. I, <laughs> I've had to come to grips with it. But you know what? He made me exactly who I needed to be. And he made you exactly who you needed to be. Would you stand this morning? He says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I set you apart for my purpose, for my glory. And see, it's a lie of the enemy for for you and I to devalue ourselves. For this reason, you didn't give yourself worth. And why should you be the one to take your worth away? God is the one that gives you value. And only God can take that value away. Maybe you're here today and the first thing I like to do is is if you don't know Jesus Christ because we've been talking about how important relationship is. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I want to give you an opportunity. I didn't ask you if you knew about Jesus It's do you have a relationship with Jesus? It's a big difference. As I've often said, um, football season is on us and you you may have a favorite player. You may know who they are, what team they play for, where they were born, what high school they went to. You know all of their stats. You know everything about, you probably know more about them than they know about themselves. But if you were to knock on their door, they wouldn't know who you are. And sometimes we we do this with Christ. We collect so much information and we know so much about Jesus that we, we, we say that that equals relationship when it does not equal relationship. And what we want to do today is give you the opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're here today or watching online, We want you to pray with us because the Bible says first we must believe in our heart and then we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask him to forgive all of our sins. He's faithful and just. He forgives us all of our, wipes the slate clean. You get a brand new start. If that's you today, I want you to pray with us um, as we pray together as as the church and then we'll, we'll go into the next part of our altar service. But Father, would you pray with us? Father, Forgive me because I am a sinner. Jesus, I know what you did for me. You gave your body as a living sacrifice. Broken open and your blood poured out for my sins. I'm asking you, Jesus, Forgive me of all my sins. Be my Savior, my Lord, and my God. Holy Spirit, come and live in me. Empower me to live my life in a way that honors and pleases the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I thank you today. I thank you for those, God, that have called on you, God. You know the hearts, Father. You know, Father, the, you, don't, you don't so much as hear words as you see the heart. But I thank you, God, for what you're doing in their lives. And now you may be here tonight. And everything that we do, we work to this point right here. You may be here today and and maybe you haven't seen the value that Christ has placed upon you. Maybe 
Maybe you've valued yourself more than you have your relationship with God. The reason I say that is because sometimes we don't value the relationship. We don't, we don't spend time in His presence. We don't, we don't pray. We don't read the way that we should and just meditate on the Word of God and, and, and have just fellowship with God Himself. And as a result, we begin to look at ourselves. And when we begin to look at ourselves, we devalue God. But when we look to God, we realize our true worth and value. And today, maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe you've lived and you've undervalued yourself. Maybe you haven't seen the value that Christ has placed upon you in a long time. Maybe you've taken it for granted. I believe that the Holy Spirit is working on you and speaking to your heart this morning. And I want to give you the opportunity to to be restored. And that's why we have these altars. It's just as a... these, These altars symbolize us laying our burdens down. These altars symbolize us just giving it over to God. And if that's you, I want you to have the freedom this morning to be able to come into the altar and just... And just make that right with God to find healing for your soul. Because I believe that once you understand and realize the value that Christ has placed on you, things in your life will begin to change. Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And then if you just need prayer, if you're sick in your body, if there's something that you're facing, something you're going to be, you're going to be facing this week or going through even now, I invite you to come. We'll have somebody come and pray with you. But as we worship this morning, I want you just to have the freedom to come and lay these things before God. Father, we thank you today. We thank you, Father, for your presence. We thank you, God. And Lord, in these next few moments, God, as we just, as we just freely come, God, We need your help. Every one of us needs your help. Father, you know that I'm the one that needs it more than anybody else in this place. We don't say that, God, flippantly, God. We we mean that. God, when I'm weak, then is your strength made perfect in me. When I come to that place where I depend upon you, God, and I cast all of myself on you, God, when I get to that place where I decrease and you increase, God, it's your value that you placed upon us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name. Father, we're so thankful. We're so thankful, God, that you, through your word, Father, have revealed to us, God, the infinite value that you've placed upon each one of us. And that God, that you are not a God that is afar off, but you are a God that is at hand, that a God that is near. Lord, you declared in your word, Father, that when we call upon you, Father, you would hear us. And that, Lord, that you are a very present help in our time of trouble, in our time of need. And Father, I thank you that you're a God who moves, a God who responds A God who has seen, Father, not just in word, but in deed, in action. And Lord, I do believe, Father, that you're still moving among your people, God, in these times. We thank you that we can bring our hurts and and, and, and all of those things, God, to you, God. The things that we're facing, the troubles, God, that seem to be mounting up against us. But God, we trust you. And you are faithful and true. And I thank you, God, for rescuing us, for releasing us, for setting us free, for setting us free, God, from Satan himself, for for setting us free, Father, from the bondage of sin, and God, even for setting us free from ourselves. That, God, that we don't put the limitations, I pray, on you anymore but we see father how god that you have set us free so that we can serve you without limits that you would be glorified in us and through us we thank you father in the mighty mighty name of 
Jesus Christ. Can we give him praise today? He's so worthy. He's so worthy. He's so worthy. I'm so thankful that he does what he does because only he can do what he does. Amen.